my channel. For those of you who are new here, my name's Elise and I am currently in recovery from anorexia. So today's video is going to be a bit of a sit down and chat video. Um, I will be having a snack soon. So grab yourself a snack to have with me. And we're going to be talking about, again, understanding anorexia and the biology behind anorexia. So this is part two. I've already done a part one. Um, and we're going to go through some different things. We're going to go through the genet understanding the genetics, the neural wiring, hunger and extreme hunger, um, movement compulsions and gastrointestinal symptoms. So um, I did used to be a dietitian, as I mentioned in the last video I did of this. Um, so I do have a health science background. So I have actually gone and researched a lot of this information. And the reason I'm talking about anorexia specifically is because that's what I have and that's what my experience is and I can't speak for um, the other disorders. So just a reminder that this advice, if this isn't advice as such, it's just an educational tool just to help people and yourselves understand what, what is going on when you have anorexia. And I find it personally, I find it really helpful if um, I understand the science or the biology of my issue, because then I realize like, I'm not actually crazy. There's actually a reason this is happening. So like, for example, extreme hunger, there's actually a biological reason for having this, or even talking about genetics, like there's a biological reason that you might've developed an eating disorder. So I just thought I'd share that. So this doesn't replace advice from a treatment team or a medical professional. If you do find yourself struggling, um, or you know someone who is, you've just stumbled upon this video, um, please seek help and please reach out. I'll put a list of um, resources at the end of the video. But yeah, so it's a bit chilly today. I've got my jumper on, uh, my kidna jumper on. Um, I'm gonna go make myself a snack and I will see you shortly. And we're gonna chat and snack and learn a bit more about anorexia. So if, if you're not up to listening to some of the details of it, as in like the science behind it, please don't feel obligated to watch this movie either. So I will see you shortly. So I've grabbed my snack. I've got my soy coffee and my little chocolate to have for snack today. So I'm gonna have a sip because I need the caffeine. And so I thought we'd start this chat by talking about um, the genetics of anorexia. You know, there's around 50% chance of risk of developing ED if you have the genes and it is inheritable. Of course, this depends on the individual and their unique circumstances. So for anyone with a genetic risk, being in an environment, being in an environment with triggers that, that that triggers the gene can lead to disordered eating, which is really challenging in today's society, especially because we pretty much live in a disordered world. You know, thinness is glamorized, restricting yourself is glamorized. And as awful as it is, that's the world we live in. And I can see it slowly starting to shift into more body positivity and more body inclusive world, but it's still got such a long way to go. Um, so engaging in any dieting behaviors or disorder behaviors can actually trigger this gene and lead to the development of an ED. So I think this is really important to understand because it's not your fault you've gotten sick. There were environment, you had a gene, there are environmental triggers, nature loaded the gun, the environment pulled the trigger. You know, you can't blame yourself or really anyone else. It's just the luck of the draw when it comes to genes. So that is something that really helped me feel a bit better about it because I was just, you know, I blame myself for getting sick and the guilt from putting everyone through this, like, oh, could I, could I avoid this? Well, it is what it is. And, you know, today I'm here talking to you. So maybe this was all meant to be for a reason. So there's also another unique genetic component known as survivor genes. Um, much of the treatment of anorexia is around managing medical complications. However, not everybody with anorexia will show medical problems such as, um, such as, issues with the heart, blood tests and more. Some people can be severely sick and underweight and still have their tests come back normal. Um, this is the survivor genes. The body is putting it all its effort into maintaining normal function. So, you know, you, the markers of sickness doesn't actually tell you how sick someone is. Someone can be severely underweight, but have completely normal bloods. And honestly, that's what happened to me. Um, that's why it took so long for me to get treatment because they couldn't find a medical reason for me to get help, but you know, it is what it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and open my chocolate. We've got a salted caramel one today. Um, so the next part I wanna talk about is actually the neural wiring. So what's happening in the brain. 
um, neurons that wire together fire together. So pathways in the brain that are formed and reinforced through repetition. So you might have heard like, this is why recovery is so challenging because these pathways are automatic behaviors now. So trying to change the pathways means it takes a lot of repetition of the new behavior to rewire. This is why challenge repeat is so important and it is also so difficult because we literally have to rewire our brain. So, you know, the more you get into your disorder, like the more behaviors become your, just your standard normal. So restricting just becomes a normal behavior. Movement might just become a normal behavior. And you don't even realize you're doing these things because neurons that wire together, fire together. So in recovery, we have to un, like rewire all these pathways and it is freaking hard to do. And it takes a lot of time. And again, like I said, that's why challenge repeat is so important. If you're supporting someone with an eating disorder, them having like a chocolate just once, that's not going to rewire their pathways, but them having a chocolate several times over and over again, that'll help rewire their pathways. So a lot of recovery is just challenge, repeat, challenge, repeat. Like we don't actually like just, you can't jump from thing to thing because that's not the way the brain works. So, so when someone is struggling and making changes, just think about what is actually happening. They're, they're restructuring their brain and often the behavior change has to come before any mental change occurs. It takes time and practice and patience and it will be difficult at the start. But the good news is, is that it is possible to change through repetition of new recovery directed behaviors. So if you're going through recovery like me and you get frustrated because you feel like you're just getting nowhere, it's okay. And it is frustrating and it is challenging, but we are rewiring pathways and that takes time. We need to be kind to ourselves. We need to be patient with ourselves because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, if, it, if this was easy, eating disorders wouldn't exist. And so I think just being kind to yourself when it does come to rewiring the pathways. And like I said, the behavior change happens before any mental change will. You might have to mechanically make yourself eat and think about I'm sitting, I am eating, I am drinking because your brain's not wor working as a normal brain yet. It's still in starvation mode. So it's got a lot of pathways to rewire. So yeah. So the next um, little area I wanna cover is actually talking about hunger, extreme hunger and mental hunger. So you've probably heard a lot about extreme hunger and recovery, how it crops up, um, but not many people understand why it happens. So I thought it's pretty important we talk through that. So not only does the cognitions change with an ED, but hunger does as well. Um, often hunger signals are switched off and it can take a while for them to come back again due to the neural pathways. So for me, I still don't get hungry. I know I will start to get hungry as I slowly restore, but at the moment I don't get hungry. So everything, I eat on a schedule for that reason. Um, it is also common to experience extreme hunger during recovery, even if you're meeting your needs. This happens because the body, which has been deprived of food, wants to fuel itself with as much food as possible in case it doesn't get any food again for a while, which is why regular and adequate eating is so important. There is nothing wrong with you. So if you do experience this extreme hunger and you're just like, you feel like a bottomless pit, it's just your body telling you it doesn't, it's scared. It's scared it's not gonna get that food again. So it's get as much in as we can now. So this can obviously lead to some binge episodes, but just understand that it's okay. It's, it's not a bad thing to happen. It, you haven't done anything wrong. You shouldn't feel guilty for it. It's just one of those things that the body goes through when it's recovering. And soon your body will learn. The more you trust your body to get better and the more your body will trust you to get better. So um, when it comes to, if you do experience extreme hunger, there is nothing wrong with you. It's normal and will eventually stop. And the best thing you can do is to honor it your body knows what it needs. So honor that extreme hunger. Another form of hunger that occurs is mental hunger. So the incessant thinking about food. Again, this is so normal. You can probably hear the cats playing in the background. Um, again, this is so normal. It's your brain telling you it needs fuel. Even if you don't feel physically hungry, it's still, in a, it's still a hunger signal. So I do experience mental hunger, so I think about food very often, like all the time. Like I always want to be around the kitchen, I always want to be, you know, having food and all that. So I've got a lot of mental hunger, I might not have the physical hunger at the moment, but my mental hunger is telling me that my body needs fuel. And again, we need to honour it and over time and re-nourishment, it will fade and you'll have more mental space for life. So your head's probably full of food stuff, like, like food you're going to eat, stressing about food, all you think about is food. And that's because your body is hungry and 
this does take time to fade, but it can and will. So this is why people with EDs constantly think and talk about food and become obsessed. Their body is literally crying out for food. So the next component I want to talk to about is something that's really, really big for me at the moment. Um, it's movement compulsions. Um, and not so much the exercise side, that's a whole thing to itself, but movement compulsions. So um, you probably notice a lot of anore like anorexia can come with exercise or movement compulsion, and it's completely okay if you don't experience it as well. That does not mean you're any less sick than anyone else. It just means you don't have that as a symptom, but you might have something else that someone else doesn't have. So personally for me, um, movement compulsions is a really big issue. I've put some stories out and I've spoken to a few people um, and honestly, it's not just about burning calories. There's actually this thing called migration theory. So um, when the body is in starvation, you get more urges to move. So Tabitha Farah's book, The Rehab, Rehabilitate, Rewire, Recover, explains this really well. It's called migration theory. So our brain wants us to keep moving because it wants us to move to find food. Literally migrates to an abundance of food. It's, it's another survival mechanism and with recovery, it does ease. Um, so this is why like you might have really bad movement compulsions early on in your recovery. So like you might do a lot of leg jiggling or that kind of thing, but um, that does ease the more nourished you get and your body learns that it's okay, it's safe here, there's always food here for me. So this is different to an exercise compulsion, which is an unhealthy relationship with ex exercise, which I'll do probably another spiel on later, which is typically to burn calories. So I find with the movement compulsion, it's almost, it can be an anxiety thing for me as well. Like having ADHD as well, like I find it really soothing to have something moving. Um, and you know, a lot of people might feel like that as well, but it is tiring moving all the time. You know, it's tiring standing all the time. We don't need to do that. You're not going to gain weight if you sit down, I promise. You're not going to gain weight like kilograms and kilograms if you stop moving your leg. You just gain more freedom. And that's something I'm really working on at the moment. You've probably seen me in videos and I'm going to be honest about it. Like my leg jiggles a lot. Um, but it's something I'm really challenging, something I'm really working on. So like movement compulsion, so like I said, can manifest as leg jiggling or difficulty sitting down, um, the inability to lie down and rest because the brain just wants to move to find food. So someone with anorexia might be very fidgety and there is a biological basis to it. You're not crazy. Your body is like your brain is trying to get you to food. That's why it wants you to move. I think that's a really cool way of understanding this. Like it's not just you're weak because you can't fight the compulsion. There's actually a reason these compulsions are happening and you feel the need to like to do them. And again, with recovering re-nourishment, these compulsions do start to ease as we show the brain that there's an abundance of food here. We don't need to move to find more. So yeah, I think that's a really cool way of seeing it. It makes you feel a lot better that there's a reason why you feel like this. And I've still got such a long way to go in recovery, but I can see how the more I nourish myself and the more I offer my body the foods it needs and craves, the more, like the less time I think about moving, the less time I stress about not sit, like sitting down for too long, it does get better. So the final little aspect I want to talk about is actually gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, because it's really common with people with any ED to experience gastrointestinal upset and problems. The problem comes in is when we start using that as an excuse to not eat. And of course, I fully get how painful your stomach can get or crampy or how nauseous you can get. Like, I've been there. I get it. I still get like that sometimes. Um, but you've got to keep pushing through because the only way to ease these symptoms is to recover. So, like, these symptoms can include things like bloating, constipation, diarrhea, gas, abdominal pain, and early satiety. Um, this can make recovery more challenging as these symptoms can cause great discomfort. But again, it is completely normal as hard as it is. They will go away with time and re-nourishment. And this all happens because the gut does atrophy or it kind of like weakens is another word for it. Um, so the gut atrophy with prolonged starvation and fewer digestive enzymes and hormones are created. So which slows down digestion. You might've heard of gastroparesis, some people getting that. Um, it's just the slowing of digestion. So irregular and inadequate food intake also affects bowel functioning as the bowel needs to be full to be emptied. So that might be why you experience a lot of bowel troubles if you've got really ir irregular eating um, or just not eating enough. So during recovery, it is normal to experience um, 
GI upset and discomfort in the short term until things start to work again. So this isn't an excuse not to eat. And using things like heat packs and distraction can help ease the symptoms. Helping someone through this time is important as it can feel so easy to give up, but knowing this will pass does help. So I am definitely one to experience gastro symptoms. Um, like I used, used to get a lot of nausea, particularly after eating because my body wasn't used to having as much food as I do now, but I promise you it does pass with time and you've just got to get through it. Of course, if your symptoms are excruciating or you just can feel you cannot function, do go see a doctor about it because there might be more going on um, that you're aware of. So that is snack done and that is our little chat done. I know it's not the most exciting video, but I do feel it's important to have this information out there because as I said earlier, it, like understanding the biology behind stuff really helps me feel better about it. Like I don't feel like I can just blame myself for everything. There's actually a cause for it. Um, so I hope you feel the same. So I'm gonna leave a list of help um, helplines and support um, at the end of this video and I just wanted to again thank anyone who has supported anyone with an eating disorder and taking the time to watch this and learn a little bit more because we can't do this alone we do need support and it means the world to us so there's also another video that's really good to watch the Laura Hill video um, I'll put the link at the end as well um, she gives you a really great understanding of what it's like to be in the brain of someone with an eating disorder it's really helpful to watch so I hope this video has helped and like I said I'm sorry it wasn't that exciting but we had our snack together we had a good chat and I will be filming again later in the week I have a big challenge coming up which I'm trying not to think about but we will get there so be kind to yourself be kind to your mind and yeah I just hope I hope that you are going okay and just know that I'm always here for you so don't forget to follow me on Instagram and like and subscribe I'll see you in the next video